We are going to talk about sex today, <clears throat> but we're going to talk about it from an evolutionary, hormonal, and neural base uh, bases. Uh, this is chapter 12 in your textbook. Really good textbook. Uh, it's really kind of interesting because I was reading an article this morning um, about a, um, a very highly educated individual in India. She uh, she's uh, she's in the ministry. She's very highly educated, but she was educated in India. India is a fairly uh, conservative country. Uh, they have taboos just like uh, the Navajo people do. Um, and one of the things that you don't talk about is sex. Uh, she was saying that the only uh, information she had about sex uh, came in one uh, biology class when she was in high school. Um, so when she got married, she had no idea what was supposed to happen next. So over the years, um, of course, she stayed married to her to her husband for, for an extended length of time. Uh, and she had no idea whether what was happening was supposed to be happening, how it was supposed to be happening. Now, what was what was going to happen next? Um, and it turned out when she finally uh, entered the ministry and uh, she started looking on the Internet and she uh, was looking at uh, other information, uh, what she discovered was that uh, what had uh, what her husband was defining as sex was turned out to be rape. Uh, it was fairly coercive. Um, there was no cons consens consensus to it. Uh, he had sex with her whenever he wanted. Um, and, and she said uh, it was never pleasurable. And she discovered that, that it was supposed to be pleasurable. Uh, so this is one of those subjects that uh, nobody talks about, but everybody needs to know about because just about everybody does it in one form or another. Another article I was reading... Um, about uh, the internet and they were talking about what's going to happen in the future what sex is going to look like in the future what our society is going to look like in the future and of course you can see things in a positive light or you can see things in a more uh, dystopian light <clears throat> and it said uh, with uh, with all the pornography on, on the internet and all the strange fetishes that are being played out uh, in the pornography that uh, it's possible that uh, uh, that uh, reproduction will become um, not just secondary, but uh, tertiary, something that nobody ever thinks about in the future. Uh, all they're thinking about is, is, is what they're reading on, on uh, or watching on, uh, on, on the Internet. Uh, another thing that they were talking about was uh, AI girlfriends, uh, where you acquire an AI girlfriend, Right now, if you want one, it just it costs nine dollars and ninety nine cents a month. Uh, she is. You have lots of different uh, styles to choose from. A lot of different ages. A lot of different looks. Um, you can select the one that you want, and uh, she will. Uh, she will be your girlfriend, and she will send you nude photos of herself, even though these are not real human beings. <laughs> So in essence, there, it's art. It's what it is. Somebody's drawing of uh, of uh, what your girlfriend is supposed to look like, and they're saying that uh, in the future, men might not get married and have babies and take care of those babies. And if they do get somebody pregnant, of course, why would they? I mean, they've got an online girlfriend that takes care of all their needs, and you can needs in quotes, um, but if they do happen to have a, a child, they'll have no clue what they were supposed to, uh, that they're supposed to take care of them. Uh, so we, we may be at a, at a turning point in, in uh, human evolution, um, a turning point uh, to the extent that uh, this, uh, the idea of uh, human sexuality uh, skews, it changes, it evolves into something else, something that's beyond uh, uh, men and women uh, having sex together, as weird as that may seem. So let's go ahead and talk about this. And, you know, every time I, every time I, I teach this chapter um, on, the, on the Navajo Nation, it, uh, 
uh, I get a little antsy because, well, I'm going to talk about uh, something that is a taboo topic. And potentially you could uh, complain about it and get this whole section taken out or whatever. Uh, but I think this is really important. Uh, it's really kind of interesting because uh, when I taught, uh, when I was teaching uh, psychology up in uh, Montana on another reservation to another group of uh, indigenous people, uh, their idea of sex was a little bit, was a lot different, um, to the extent that, uh, the, the question is, where do you get your information? Uh, and I can tell you where I got my information. Most of my information came off, uh, from my friends talking about it. And then I had, we had a really good, um, uh, health class, uh, when I was in the eighth grade, seventh or eighth grade. And it covered all the topics that you uh, would potentially need to talk about. I don't think that health class could be taught today because uh, he, our, our health teacher was very frank with us. Uh, and I think probably uh, religious people would, uh, the conservative uh, people in the United States now would tell him he couldn't say those things. He couldn't give us that information. Uh, but he was very frank and, and he gave us a lot of good information. And I'm... I'm uh, pleased that he did, and, and I'm thankful that uh, that he was so frank about uh, about all this information, because otherwise, I mean, where would I have gotten that inf the same information? How would I know um, what uh, sexual intercourse was supposed to look like? Anyway, so every time I, like I said, every time I teach, oh, well, I was talking about that other, <laughs> the, the other, the other indigenous uh, group uh, that I, I used to teach up in Montana. It was kind of interesting because um, uh, when I taught this this very same chapter, uh, not well, it's changed a little bit, but when I taught this same chapter out of this very same book, um, it was um, it was well received by everybody, and everybody was very interested in what I had to say and. And we discussed uh, sex in class. It was really kind of interesting. Uh, as it turns out, uh, that group of indigenous people, um, the uh, uh, children, uh, teenagers, get their uh, sexual information from their grandparents. Uh, and they do it with humor, as, as interesting as that is. So a lot of things, when, that when they talk about uh, intercourse, a lot of it ha is... Uh, they they taught it with uh, with a lot of humor, and because of that, it's it's viewed and it's um, uh, people approach it with with a different mindset, and, and it was a fairly positive mindset. Um, I don't know. You can look at all this any way you like, but they were they seemed to be pretty fairly happy with what was going on. Uh, anyway, so when I taught this, I didn't I wasn't nearly as antsy. Up north as I am uh, when I teach it uh, on the Navajo Nation. So let's go ahead and get started and we'll talk about it. Uh, first things we're going to talk about is, is actually having uh, intercourse. Uh, and I'll tell you exactly how it works. Um, the first stage is sexual attraction. Uh, in most species, sexual attraction cannot take place until the female is ready to reproduce. We're humans. We can have sex any time. Um, but, uh, in other species like, uh, bo bovines, like, uh, uh, canines, like felines, um, the male has to determine when the female is ready to have sex. She can't have sex unless she is, is, is ready to have sex. Uh, this can be judged by whether males approach her and how rapidly they approach her. Uh, why are they approaching her? Because of her scent. She puts off a uh, pheromone, a pheromone, a pheromone. <laughs> I, got, I was, <laughs> I got hormone and pheromone <laughs> mixed up. Okay. Anyway, the female will put off pheromones, and it will show that, uh, and it, and the males will be attracted to her odor, um, and if she allows them to approach, then potentially they can have intercourse. In many mammalian species, the female will demonstrate her approachability through swelling in the vaginal area. That is a different color and an odor regulated by a surge in estrogen. And of course, uh, those of you who are uh, who uh, have uh, cattle uh, or goats or sheep, uh, you know that this is th this is what you have to do in order 
uh, to make sure that your um, that your um, flock increases. In most species, intercourse is not possible without full female cooperation. Uh, so it, it's rape is not is not something that normally happens. Or they can damage the uh, they can damage the female. Appetite behavior, uh, behavior that establishes, maintains, or promotes sexual behavior. So in, in humans, of course, sexual attraction has to do with sexual attraction. Somebody uh, looks at somebody and they think, uh, I would like to have sex with them. Um, what are they thinking? Are they potentially both sides are thinking, I would like to have sex with this and the other individual. So the sexual attraction is there. <clears throat> And their bodies start getting prepared to potentially have sex. Appetite behavior in stage two, uh, behavior that establishes, maintains, or promotes sexual behavior. When a female is displaying this behavior, she may approach a male. She may stay close to the male. She may uh, show alternating approach and retreat behavior. Uh, she may move in a specific manner that will result in the male mounting the female. Of course, this is not humans, of course. Um, but... Uh, uh, she may touch the male. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, signs that human females will do. They'll they'll uh, play with their hair. They'll touch their faces. Um, <clears throat> they will uh, look at the male uh, with a prolonged stare. Those are just some of the behaviors that females will uh, will do. Um, now I've been off the market for a really long time, so. Uh, whatever's going on now, I'm not really sure. Uh, anyway, this is known as pro pre uh, pro perceptive behavior, where the, the female, this is of another species, not especially humans, of course. Um, they will do all these things. They'll approach them. They'll stay close to them. They'll, uh, may, may, they may allow them to, uh, to mount them. Male appetitive behavior may consist of staying near and sniffing the female, and that's with other species, not with humans, of course. Copulation and coitus. Uh, copulation uh, begins when the male is, uh, puts his penis in the female's vagina, an act known as intromission. Through rhythmic movements, the male will then squirt sperm-filled semen into the female's reproductive tract. After copulation, the two will go through a period when they will not be able to re-engage in intercourse, known as the refractory phase. However, a male presented with another female may show a shorter refractory phase, and this is called the Coolidge effect. When a female is re uh, ready to copulate, uh, to copulate, she will be sexually receptive. Uh, okay, so what do I need to explain to you? Uh, humans, of course, this is exactly the way it works. Uh, the male uh, puts his uh, uh, penis inside the vagina. The vagina has been lubricated. Uh, there is some lubrication uh, on the head of the penis. Uh, the lubrication is mostly uh, female lubrication. It allows the uh, the uh, penis to move uh, uh, in, into the vagina uh, easily uh, or readily, and that's how intercourse occurs. Uh, for humans, it uh, tends to be prolonged, more prolonged than with other species. Other species, uh, is, it's relatively quick. Uh, okay, so for the Coolidge effect, um, <laughs> Calvin Coolidge was the president of the United States. I don't know, he's like 24th president. No, he's more than that. I don't know. Anyway, he was the president of the United States back in the 1920s. And uh, they used to call him Silent Cal because he never said anything. He, never, he didn't talk a lot. Um, this was uh, just as radio was becoming popular. And uh, he was just not much of a speaker. So they were, he and his wife were, were at a uh, farm in Iowa, actually. Coolidge is from, I don't know where Coolidge is from, North Dakota or South Dakota someplace. Anyway, they were on a for, farm in Iowa, and uh, it was a chicken farm. And uh, they, uh, <laughs> the... Uh, the uh, farmer had a rooster, and he had, I don't know, a, a half dozen hens or a dozen hens. And uh, 
the uh, Mrs. Coolidge asked uh, the farmer, well, how many, how many of these hens can he reproduce with? And he says, well, he'll reproduce with all of them. He can, he can have intercourse with all of them. And she said, how, how rapidly does he do that? He said, well, it doesn't take very much time at all. Uh, he could do it all, all, all 12 of these uh, females right now. And so she <laughs> went over to Calvin and she was teasing. She said, look, this rooster's got 12 hens and he can reproduce with all of them at the same time. And uh, Calvin said, well, I could probably do the same thing if I had 12 different hens. That was the joke anyway. And that, that's why it's called the, uh, the refractory phase. If uh, a male presented with more than one female potentially can have intercourse with, uh, with all the females in his vicinity. And that's known as the Coolidge effect because of the joke that Calvin told his wife. And there you go. Stage four is post-copulatory behavior. This is different in most species. The males of all mammals but primates receive and maintain their erections with a bone in their penis called an os penis. Fascinating. Um, primates, of course, do not have this. Um, Primates don't have a bone uh, that, uh, that, uh, that causes their erection. They have a blood flow, uh, um, restricted blood, blood flow, to, not, not restricted. They have excessive blood flow to the area, and that's what creates their, their erections. Um, so because of the os penis, uh, from time to time, um, the, the male will get stuck in the female's vagina because the bone will not retract properly. Uh, this happens with dogs sometimes, um, or it used to. I, I haven't really seen this lately, but boy, I'll tell you, when I was growing up, this seemed to happen all the time, as weird as that may be. I guess it's because in the old days, we didn't, uh, we, we didn't fix dogs. We didn't uh, neuter dogs as much as we do now. And so, you know, dogs were... There was a lot of intercourse taking place, especially if you had a female dog. But now, of course, to control the dog population, we're getting dogs <clears throat> neutered so that they don't have these desires and abilities. The whole purpose of copulation is a joining of the male and the female gametes, the ova and the female and the sperm and the male. If the two join, the ova will become fertilized and the union will become a zygote. While all mammals, birds, and most reptiles fertilize inside the body, internal fertilization, fish and frogs fertilize outside the body, external fertilization. If the species lays eggs outside the body, as birds and reptiles do, it is called oviparity, egg birth. If the species allows the zygote to develop in the female's body, it is referred to as viviparity, live birth. For most creatures, there is only one sexual position they can be in for copulation to be possible. Since most mammals walk on all fours and have a tail, reproduction can only take place if the female raises her rump and moves her tail to the side. This will usually straighten her vagina adequately for penetration. And this is known as lordosis. And that's what it looks like. This is a cat in heat. She's moved her tail over to the right, her left. Uh, and um, she is uh, raising her, her rump so that uh, the penetration is possible. And she has straightened out her, her vagina. And this is known as lordosis. That's what lordosis looks like. So if you see a cat doing this or a dog doing this, that is why they are doing it, so that they can reproduce. For frogs to mate successfully, the male must mount the female. There is no penetration, but as the female emits her unfertilized eggs, the, ma the male must release his semen. If this uh, does not take place in or over water, reproduction will not take place. This position is known as amplexus. It looks like he's mounted her uh, to, for penetration purposes, but that's not why he's there. He's there to squirt his sperm on the eggs as she drops them. And there's the eggs in the water. And if, she, if they don't do this over water, it's not going to happen. There's not going to be any reproduction. No reproduction will take place. Amplexus. 
While sexual response is extremely complex, the female anatomy for intercourse is relatively simple. Two folds of skin cover the, and protect the vaginal opening, and these are known as the, the labia. Uh, the one on the outside is called the labia majora, and the one on the inside is called the labia minora, two flaps of skin. The female erectile tissue is the clitoris above the vaginal opening. And that is very similar to the penis. It becomes erect uh, with intercourse, so it responds to stimulation. Since male delivery of the gamete requires penetration, the male system is more complex than that of the female. The reason it's more complex is because of the necessity uh, for the fluid that the sperm uh, are housed in uh, to be uh, of the proper um, pH, the proper acidity level. Actually, the proper alkalinity level, because the female vagina is acid, and what the uh, to, in order to protect her, it has to be acid. So in order for the male to reproduce with her, he has to neutralize the acidic environment of the, uh, of the female reproductive area. So in order for that to take place, then the... Uh, the uh, fluid that the sperm is uh, housed in uh, has to be alkaline. And that's what all of this, all of these different organs are for, is to produce the alkalinity for the uh, uh, semen to swim in. Okay, the erection takes place due to an engorgement of blood. This is humans. Uh, as you can see, there is no bone. Uh, semen is produced in the testes and stored in the epididymis. Uh, during ejaculation, the sperm travel up the vas deferens past the seminal vesicle, pro prostate gland, and the cowper's gland, where it picks up a viscous alkaline fluid called semen. And that is what is, uh, has to, has to uh, take place in order for the individual to reproduce. Really fascinating. Uh, I did sperm counts when I was... Uh, uh, working in the laboratory, um, and one of the things that we had to test was how alkaline the uh, semen was. Uh, it's the first thing we did as soon as we uh, we received the specimen. We had to test it for alkalinity. If it wasn't properly alkaline, then it wouldn't neutralize the the acidic uh, reproductive area of the female. Now you may wonder why in the world is the female uh, reproductive area so acidic, and the answer is to protect it from uh, bacteria. The more acidic it is, uh, the more protected it is from bacteria and viruses and funguses, uh, fungi that uh, that might um, infect the area. Normally, the male is not erect because uh, cells in the glands of the penis, the Paragigantocellular nucleus uh, sends seratinergic fibers down the spinal cord that inhibit erection. Otherwise, males would be erect all the time. During sexual excitation, the forebrain inhibits the PGN and allows the penis to become erect. Uh, selected serotonin reuptake inhibitors increase ser uh, serotonin in the brain and may not allow the inhibition of the PGN, in which case the male will not be able to get an erection if he's on SSRIs. Now that doesn't always happen, of course. Uh, there is just a select amount of, of serotonin uh, in the um, uh, SSRI, uh, so it's possible for him to get an erection uh, and over, um, overshadow the, or, or have a, a more of a, an impact on the PGN, allowing the, uh, the uh, uh, it to block the PGN, to inhibit the PGN. While there is no normal or typical when it comes to sexual response, too many social and psychological factors, women achieve vaginal lubrication during the excitement phase. Males have a smaller uh, amount of lubricating exudate uh, during erection to ease penetration. There is no specific amount that has to happen. There is. This is just... And, and this is something that, that is rarely talked about unless you've got somebody that can't reproduce. And then, and then of course, uh, the, the doctor will investigate all of this information. 
if the individual is having trouble reproducing, uh, one of the things that we'll look at is how much uh, how alkaline it is, whether there is sperm in his uh, his ejaculate. Um, we um, when I was working. Uh, when I was in the service, we had an individual that, that couldn't reproduce, a male that couldn't reproduce, didn't seem to be able to reproduce. He'd had a girlfriend that wanted to get pregnant, couldn't get her pregnant, didn't get her pregnant. Um, she left him and, and he found another girlfriend. Uh, he was, wasn't was using condoms. Uh, there was no reason why she wasn't getting pregnant. Um, you know, They potentially wanted to get married, but they wanted to, have, to make sure that she could have a baby first. She wasn't getting pregnant. She wasn't getting pregnant. So he produced a semen specimen, and we looked at it. And what we discovered was there was the volume was really was was good. He had a, enough uh, semen. That wasn't the problem. The problem was there weren't any any sperm in it. What had happened was. What the doctor assumed happened was there was a mucal plug somewhere. There was uh, a plug that kept the uh, semen from, or the sperm from uh, from actually entering the semen. So he was ejaculating fine. He was having erections. That wasn't the problem. The problem was that the semen wasn't able to get into the the uh, the sperm wasn't able to get into the semen. He had a mucal plug. Bizarre. Eventually, of course, uh, and he'd had he'd been having sex for a you know, number of years. Um, and, uh, and of course, we weren't exactly sure when the mucal plug had, had formed, <clears throat> but eventually, of course, he um, he was able to get rid of the mucal plug and and reproduce. But he used to come in every week and give us a specimen that was not any fun at all. Um, it might have been for him, but not for us. We had to look at it. <clears throat> Uh, males typically have one basic pattern of response, but they do pass through a refractory phase after orgasm when erection is difficult. Uh, females, however, rarely have a refractory phase, thus multiple orgasm is possible. But they have three typical patterns of response, and these are the three typical uh, patterns of response. Male response is about the same every time. Um, they're having intercourse, they're having intercourse, there's a plateau... Uh, they know they're going to orgasm, and then they orgasm, and then they go into the refractory phase, and that's it. Uh, that's just about it. Uh, for the female, though, it all depends on how she, what she's thinking about, uh, how much stimulation she's had. She can have one of uh, these are the three normal, normal. These are the three that uh, have been uh, observed. Um, there, were, <clears throat> of course. <laughs> Before Kinsey, nobody even talked about sex, and we never worried about what was going on or, or whatever. People were, were reproducing, uh, and, and nobody was saying anything about it. And then Kinsey came along. Kinsey decided he was going to, to study sexual intercourse, and so he studied it. And then Masters and Johnson came along, and they decided that they would also study it. Uh, and this co actually comes out of Masters and Johnson. Um, what they discovered was the, the male response is almost always the same. Uh, sometimes it's quick, sometimes it's, it's a little bit slower, but the female response uh, can be anything. And a lot of times it doesn't have anything to do with him uh, as much as it has to do with what she's thinking about or how she's responding. So sometimes she has a response very similar to his. That's A. Uh, the B response is no orgasm. Um, just a heightened, uh, uh, heightened excita excitation, and then the last one, of course, is another uh, is is another orgasm, but it's a prolonged orgasm, as as interesting as that is. But it's it's relatively quick. You can see there's there's hard there's no plateau, but it's a prolonged or orgasm. And of course, at any point, she can have a, a second orgasm. Uh, it's usually with the uh, with the uh, uh, A-type response. She'll have a second, or a third, or a fourth, or a fifth orgasm. It's it's always possible. It 
depending on lots of different factors, just tons of different factors. In many situations in nature, the males and females of the species are very much different in size as well as structure. In most vertebrates, the male is larger because he must battle other males for the right to reproduce. Another definition of sexual dimorphism is that the male gamete is abundant, small, and cheap, while the female gamete is large, rare, and expensive. What are we talking about? A uh, female will uh, have ova. Uh, she uh, usually produces one ova. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about humans. Uh, every month, uh, a female will uh, probably have one ova, maybe two ova. Uh, if she gets pregnant, uh, then it will take her nine months to, uh, to have a baby. So... She has one, one or two a month. That's the large part. It's relatively rare because it's only once a month, and it's expensive because it takes her nine months to reproduce. The male uh, produces millions and millions of sperm every day. He can reproduce, potentially he can re reproduce every day. So his are cheap. What did I say? His, his are relatively cheap. Abundant, small, and cheap. There you go. Because of the low cost of uh, producing sperm, uh, males can easily gather enough nutrients and energy to impregnate millions of women. Whether males are selective or not, the odds are that they will have some offspring that survive. Females, on the other hand, have to be more selective. And there's a reason why I have J-Lo here. Because J-Lo has actually been married, I don't know, four or five times. And now she's married to Ben Affleck, but she he was one of her first boyfriends after P. Diddy. Females that carefully nurture their costly eggs are more likely to have offspring that survive to be the next generation. Thus, females must mate carefully. Males that carry many beneficial genes are more likely to provide the female's offspring with favorable genes. But how does a woman do this? How in the world does she select a male? The female must closely observe uh, the appearance and behavior of the male. Uh, a vigorous, healthy male is more likely to carry good genes than an unhealthy one. Uh, thus, courtship is a, a period uh, when the female assesses the genetic makeup of a male to judge the suitability as a mate. And this is J Lo again. And I don't—I hate to pick on her. I'm not really picking on J Lo, but she chose several different males as her. Uh, to marry, and this is Mark Anthony, I think. He, she had twins with Mark Anthony, and but that those, those are the only children she has, I think. Like, and now she's married to Ben Affleck, but uh, she's out. Uh, she's in her fifties, so she's not going to reproduce anymore. But this is the ma male that she's with now, and these are three of the other men that she have mar has married. And she has a baby. Ba she has babies with this one. And for a while, she was dating uh, uh, a Rod, Alex Rodriguez, the baseball player. I should have changed this because she's married to Ben now. <laughs> she was dating a Rod for the longest time. Anyway, so she's been with a lot of different. She's been with him a lot of different men, and, and obviously she has the, uh, because of her beauty and, and her wealth, uh, she can select any male that she wants. And uh, she ended up with Ben. Of course, she has the thus far. It's hard to tell what's going to happen in the future. Let's assume that uh, she'll stay married to Ben. There are four mating strategies that are used in the animal kingdom to ensure, I, and I, I'm sorry, like I said, I, I hate to pick on J-Lo, but uh, uh, Jennifer Lopez, but uh, she's such a good example of someone, uh, a female making uh, uh, decisions uh, as to who she's going to uh, mate with, and the individual she mated with was this individual right here. She dated um, Ben Affleck when she was relatively young, so she could have reproduced with him, but something happened. I'm not sure what. 
none of my business. There are four mating strategies that are used in the animal kingdom to ensure offspring survival. The first is promiscuity. Females will mate with more than one male or as many as they can uh, in any mating season. This will ensure that the male with the most attributes going for him are more, is more likely to be the sire of her offspring, and they are more likely to, to uh, survive uh, and uh, to survive into maturity. Polygamy, uh, uh, also known as polygamy, uh, is where the uh, male maintains a harem of females that he will exclusively mate with. Uh, most ungulates uh, mate in this fashion, as do gorillas and the elephant seal. Uh, this is also practiced among humans in many parts of the world. And this is a marriage ceremony. That's the husband right there. And these are his four wives. That's his first wife. That's his second wife. That's his third wife. And this is the young lady he's marrying right now. So he has four wives. Polyandry is rarer than polygyny, but is still known to occur. In polyandry, one woman mates with more than one man, but those men uh, can only mate with a single female. This is practiced in some era, some villages in Tibet. Uh, usually she will marry brothers. And of course, since they're used to, uh, they have grew up together, um, there is very little fighting. They, they uh, share the work and whatnot. Monogamy is the most prevalent mating method among humans. In monogamy, a pair will form a mating pair where exclusive access is maintained between both the male and the female. This seems to be the best manner uh, in which a woman can gain resources uh, from the male uh, when uh, he must provide for his children to ensure that they survive. And now, if I understand correctly, um, the uh, Diné people used to practice polygyny. Uh, a, a male would uh, reproduce with, uh, would have a harem, or not a harem, he'd have two or three wives. Now this was also practiced uh, in the uh, northern tribes, the northern plains tribes, um, who hunted buffalo and they needed, they needed uh, uh, individuals to uh, process the meat and the, and the uh, uh, skins of the buffalo. Sexual selection takes place when the female selects the male that they wish to mate with. Sexual selection among birds is the most garish of all creatures. In order to attract a female, a male will weigh themselves down with impossible structures such as the peacock's tail. And of course, the bigger the tail, the more likely that he will be able to reproduce. Uh, so that has to be in an isolated community because otherwise the peacock would not exist. Uh, they would have, the you know, predators would have killed them all. But peacocks were able to survive in China, in Asia. Some species participate in intricate mating rituals during courting that are not only garish but call attention to themselves from predators. Almost all male birds have intricate songs that they sing in the spring during mating to attract a female. In some species, courting is extensive. Among large cats, only vigorous exercise over several days will bring the female to ovulation. This is the way it is with the, with the cheetah. Uh, usually a, a, a pair of brothers will chase a female cheetah, and they have to keep her running for days, so they'll trade off uh, chasing her. <clears throat> and by the um, by the second or third day they uh, that she has ovulated and uh, one of them will be able to reproduce it with her or both of them will and uh, of course it doesn't really matter which one does since they are genetically very similar Wadabi males of Niger uh, trying to charm females with eye movements and makeup and I'm going to show you uh, the Wadabi this is a, a video about the Wadabi. The men sing and sway to gain attention. They flutter. 
Wait a minute. Okay. Their cheeks cross and roll their eyes and grin. Whites of eyes and teeth are considered particularly beautiful. A man who can roll one eye and grin at the same time is considered especially desirable. The Garawal bring two different Wadobi lineages together, allowing each clan to propagate. Parents arrange first marriages at birth, and only cousins of the same lineage may marry. After that, they may seek a partner from another lineage. Mo Reube works his charm on Mary Amor. It appears to be working. The young wife decides she will allow him to steal her from her husband. I'm with a husband that I don't like, and when I saw Moray Ube, he was the best. He was better than any of the others, so that's why I agreed to marry him and go home with him. A Wadabi woman can't be taken against her will. But what Moray Ube is about to do in the name of love can still have fatal consequences. If they get caught en route, then the husband has the right to require her to come back. If she disagrees, doesn't want to go back, there can often be a fight, and it can be uh, to the death. Mo Ube must plan carefully to steal his new wife and not lose his life. I go to see the girl, and I explain to her that I want her. And if she says that she wants me, then I look for her husband. If he doesn't see me, I sneak up on the ground. If she accepts, I say come and look around. If I hear somebody coming, I hide. The moment of truth arrives. Under cover of darkness, Mo Ube heads toward Mario Moore's camp not knowing if he will be greeted by her husband's sword. The ideal is if she makes it all the way to the new husband's house without being caught, and then she has the full right to stay. The new day will reveal whether More Ube's dangerous gamble pays off. The Wadabi are nomadic. They travel the desert and its fringes in extended family groups. This Garawal is an opportunity to mix between those groups and widen the gene pool for each clan. The men can have many wives, but when a Wadabi woman becomes pregnant, she will return to her mother's home, where she will remain for three or four years. During that time, she must not see or speak with her husband, and he is free to gather more wives. It is early morning, the day after the Garawal. Mo Reube returns from his quest. Last night, the game of love went his way. When he snuck into Mary Amor's camp, fate or good fortune were on his side. Her husband was not there. There you go. Wow, that's just like uh, Romeo and Juliet. Okay, now we're going to see how the Maasai decide who, who to marry. Maybe. There we go. Watch where you
Okay, the idea was that uh, the person that bounces the highest is the most attractive. And the reason that they're the most attractive is because the Maasai are uh, herders and they have cattle. And um, they live on the plains, the Serengeti, and um, the, uh, they need to look over the, the horizon. They need to find all of their... Uh, oops, They need to. Uh, <laughs> they need to find their cattle. They need to look for predators, and the one that bounces the highest is uh, is somebody that uh, will be able to take care of their flock, um, the herd, uh, and and to be able to protect the herd from uh, from predators. Uh, you saw the guy with the with the uh, skin on his head. Uh, that was an individual that had killed a lion. That was a lion's um, mane <clears throat> uh, made into a headdress. And, of course, it made him lo also look like uh, he was bouncing higher than everybody else. But those were males looking for, for um, a wife. as you, The females were in a semicircle around uh, on the other side of them, where the camera was, actually. And uh, that was the idea. So this group uh, rolls their eyes and, and shows off their teeth and, and uh, wears lovely hats. And uh, the Maasai bounce up and down in order to show their, uh, that they are, would make good husband material. Uh, so here are, these are Wadabi women. Oops have an arrow. These are the Wadabi women. That, oops. And this is what Maasai women look like. The Wadabi consider themselves the most beautiful people in the world, as interesting as that is. But you saw what the men look like, and that's what the women look like. And these are the Maasai. Um, in order to be a uh, marriageable, uh, the women have to grow this pompadour or arrange their hair in, in this shape. Maasai women, on the other hand, shave their heads. Sexual differentiation takes place among most humans uh, while still in the womb. The sperm either carries a male or female chromosome all ova are female. So it's a sperm that determines whether somebody's going to be male or female. Uh, so if, uh, if uh, you have any children and they're, well, they're either male or female, uh, it was the uh, sperm that, that determined uh, what, uh, what gender uh, your uh, offspring were going to be. Uh, like I said, the, the female ova is always, the ova is always a female. And that's why uh, you have uh, uh, XY is, is always a male, and uh, XX is always a female. Thus, males are a heterogametic uh, sex because of the two different chromosomes, X or Y, while females are homogametic. They are always X. Very early in the development, uh, the gonads are not differentiated, and at that point, they are in different gonads. You can't tell if it's going to be a boy or a girl. In mammals, the Y chromosome contains an S, uh, uh, SRY gene that is uh, responsible for the development of the testes. If the individual has a Y chromosome, the cells of the different uh, gonads begin uh, making SRY protein. The SRY protein causes the core of the cells to proliferate over the outer layer of the cells and the gonad becomes a testis. And that's what males look like. And that's what females look like. If the individual has no Y chromosome, no SRY protein is produced and the indifferent gonads form with the outer layer dominant and the inner core is inhibited. That's, that weights only 25 pounds. As the fetus begins to form, they develop two ducts. I was just teasing. <laughs> Men don't have to look like that, and women certainly, certainly don't have to look like that. 
She doesn't look much like a woman anyway, does she? As a fetus looks like she's got more testosterone than she needs to have. <clears throat> it gives her face a, a male structure. As the fetus begins to form, they develop two ducts that connect the indifferent gonads to the cell wall, the Wolfian duct and the Mullerian duct. If bathed in testosterone from the testes, the Wolfian duct will develop. If not, the Mullerian duct will develop. If the SRY protein is released by the Y chromosome, the gonads become testes and bathe the area in testosterone. The Wolfian duct develops into the vas deferens, the epididymis, and the seminal vesicle. The Mullerian duct disappears. The genital tuber tubercle uh, becomes a penis, and the genital fold becomes a scrotum. If both the chromosomes are X's, the gonads become ovaries. The Mullerian duct develops into a fallopian tube, the uterus and inner vagina, and the Wolfian duct disappears. The genital tubercle becomes a clitoris, and the genital fold becomes the labia majora and labia minora. Testosterone from the testes releases a hormone called anti-mullerian hormone that shrinks the mullerian duct. It causes tissue around the urethra to form a prostate gland. It causes epithelial uh, tissue around the urethra to become a scrotum and a penis. The epithelial cells have 5 alpha reductase, which converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, which allows masculinization. <clears throat> if the sperm or ova do not have a sex chromosome, the individual will have only one X chromosome. This individual has Turner's syndrome and will be a female, have short, short stature, and not develop secondary sexual characteristics. Uh, I'm trying to think of what her name is. Hunt is her last name. Uh, she's on um, um, uh, NCIS uh, Los Angeles, and if you, she's she's a very famous actress, but she has Turner syndrome. That's why she's so short. And these are two individuals that are about the right same age. This is somebody with Turner syndrome, and this is her sister. This is uh, somebody with Turner syndrome, and this is her mother, and that is her sister. And I think she's older. This this sister is older than this sister, but she has Turner syndrome. If the female fetus is exposed to androgens in the uterus, she might develop congenital ad ad adrenal hyperplasia. The uh, Overactive adrenal glands will produce more androgen and, be, and cause genitalia that appears as either an undersized penis or an oversized clitoris, and that's what it looks like. Somebody with congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Since the androgen receptor is on the X chromosome, if an XY uh, individual has a defective androgen receptor, they will not be sensitive to adrenergic hormones. These individuals are referred to as androgen insensitive. These individuals will develop external female genitalia and develop all secondary female genital uh, sexual characteristics except for menarche, and they will have a shallow vagina. And that's what it looks like. And that's what happened with Semenier. And these are individuals with um, androgen insensitivity. There are a group of males in the Dominican Republic whose 5 alpha reductase converts testosterone to dihyd uh, dihydrotestosterone, which allows the penis and the scrotum to form, is mutated. Despite the fact that the individual has an XY chromosomal structure, the lack of 5 alpha reductase does not form a penis. The area that looks like a vagina has no vaginal opening. Because they do have testes with puberty, their bodies are bathed in testosterone and their penis develops. Their hips narrow and their build turns obviously masculine, like this individual at 42. These individuals who were raised and acted like females suddenly begin looking 
and acting like males. Most become males. And this is an individual. And that's an individual that uh, chose to be a female, but she has a penis. And that's an individual that chose to be a female as well. But as you can see, she has a she has male musculature. This is the individual who was raised as a female, and now that's that's them. Didn't say what they were called. Okay. Okay. Guavadoches means uh, eggs um, eggs at uh, 12 so they start becoming males at, at age 12 they're raised as females until age 12 and that's it so there you go so you these things can really mess you up if you don't uh, just be thankful that uh, everybody you know doesn't have any of these interesting problems. So I'll talk to you again next week.